three takeaways from Coakley that I've got. The first is just her treatment of gender and sexuality. And what I take away from her treatment of gender and sexuality is basically this. Gender, from a Christian theological perspective, is complicated. And much more complicated, no matter how you spin it, than the way we typically talk about gender in our culture. So our, if we take our cultural understanding of gender and biological sex as being something like you have XX chromosomes, therefore you are a woman, therefore you perform your gender as feminine, or you have XY chromosomes, therefore you are biologically male, therefore you perform your gender identity as masculine, if we take this as our kind of common sense cultural understanding of gender, and this is the understanding of gender on which both heterosexuality and homosexuality are based, right? Hetero meaning other. So two people love somebody of the other sex. And homosexual means the same. Two people of the same sex love each other. This is the binary logic, right? The logic of two-ness that structures our ordinary common sense understanding of gender. Regardless of whether or not one has bought hook, line, and sinker, Coakley's own account of gender, I hope that she has shown you that within the broad tradition of the church, thinking about gender is an awful lot more complicated than our culture's commonsensical understanding of it. What I think this invites us to as we try to grapple with questions about gender and sexuality today in the church and in our world is that we need first to do some serious theological work, going back to the Bible, figuring out how to interpret the passages, not simply regarding sexuality, but regarding gender, and then to go to the tradition and see how the tradition has thought about gender and sexuality over its history, and then to apply that rigorous reflection on Scripture through the tradition to questions that we currently face. That is a kind of reflection that has not been ventured very often by either liberals or conservatives on this issue. The conservative argument, I want to suggest, has imported from our secular culture, an understanding of gender as fixed, binary, unchanging, biologically determined, XX or XY, issuing in gender performances that map easily onto XX and XY, right? They've just assumed that when scripture is talking about male and female, that's what scripture must mean. But I think as Coakley's analyses of the early church fathers have shown us, that is not always how those passages were read. Now, we could have gone straight to the biblical source, right? And we could have looked, I could have made a case for you why the biblical authors didn't think about gender in that way. We haven't done that necessarily. You could make such a case, though. That just wasn't our class. But at least hope that, the, that Coakley's work has opened up for you the possibility of thinking differently about gender than our culture does. And I think that the conservative argument typically makes the mistake of importing a secular understanding of gender and of sexuality into the theological debate, rather than having a theological conversation from the very beginning about what sex and gender really mean for our relationship with God. Coakley's answer, of course, has been that sex and gender are not something that you can, can, can conceive of as static. Whatever it is that you are, whatever it is that you think that you are, it is liable to change because your Bodies are as caught up in your redemption as any other part of your person. It is not just your, it's not as if your, how to say this, our genders and, and sexualities, our desires, all of them, are caught up in God's work of redemption. And just like there's a great deal about us in other parts of ourselves that changes when we are redeemed, so also, who are we to say that this part of us will not also change? And I think that's the kind of, that's the spirit 
of the argument she's making. On the liberal side, the argument is typically preceded also by importing something from our secular culture, namely human rights. I don't, I'm not telling you that I don't believe in human rights or something like that. I don't want to have that debate right now. But I think that the way that the argument has typically gone, um, including in our denomination often, is the liberals say that, well, everybody has a right to get married, something like that. That is an argument that is fine for secular discourse, for a political conversation as we try to grapple with how to make meaning together in a pluralistic society. It is not, however, a theological argument for the inclusion of gay and lesbian people in all of the sacraments. Nobody has a right to a sacrament. Rights never figure into the question of sacraments. They're something else than that. Rights rhetoric, while it has a theological heritage, is not automatically theological. Again, I would suggest that Coakley would say that instead of just demanding that gay and lesbian people have a right to marriage or have a right to ordination or something like that, that you go back to the sources, go back to the Bible, figure out what the Bible really says by reading it through the tradition, seeing what Christians have made of these passages for generations, and then apply those reflections to this question that we currently grapple with in our culture. It doesn't mean that the tradition is always going to say stuff that we want it to say. We're in a conversation with it and with scripture through it. But I think Coakley has shown us, at least Coakley has shown me, that the history of Christian thought on these questions is much more complicated than I initially thought that it was. Anyway, that I think is the promise of Coakley's work, that it can kind of throw open a possibility between the traditional conservative and liberal argument precisely by calling us to renewed theological seriousness about the questions we face. Is it not an odd thing that so many of the arguments about the inclusion of LGBTQ people in the church normally proceed on political rather than theological grounds? And this is something that Coakley's written about quite a great deal, and I find her to be pretty right about this. So, that's what I think that we have, that's what I take away from her with regard to gender and sexuality. And I will say, she's had, a, she's had a great influence on this. If you look at the, as I said, I think early on, if you look at the, um, you look at the document that the liturgy and that the Standing Committee for Liturgy and Music put together for General Convention this last year on same-sex marriage, um, it was an account, you could tell it was influenced by what Coakley had done um, previously. And it's a, it's by and large, I think, a very, very good document. It's a very good start at thinking seriously theologically about these issues, rather than simply relying on secular notions that we kind of bring in from the outside to adjudicate these questions, either because we're afraid of what the Bible says, or because we're too lazy to find out. I have said that a little too forcefully, but there it is for everybody here. Um, second thing that I take away from Coakley is, there are no wide-out approaches possible. And I mean this in general, not simply in the liturgy, but also in theological history, and in theological belief. So, we, of course, we encountered um, Coakley's criticism of the tipex or whiteout approach to liturgy when we were talking about whether or not a feminist can call God Father last week. Leaving that question aside for just a minute, I think that what, regardless of how we feel about the particular proposal she has given us for why a feminist should call God Father, regardless of whether or not we find that credible, I think that what Coakley has shown me, and I hope that she's shown us, is that patriarchy and the oppression of women has so infected the Christian theological imaginary that it is a delusion to think that if we just change all the pronouns or change, if we get rid of the word father from all of the liturgies or all of our theologies, then we would have successfully erased patriarchy's influence. So there were a couple of ways that Coakley demonstrated this. I'm just going to point out two. The first is her reading of Christian history. She's been making the argument throughout the book that there's been a kind of conspiracy, maybe not a conscious one, but a conspiracy nonetheless, of political, social, and theological influences and forces that has sidelined not only women, but also the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. 
right? And she's pointed out that it has done this notwithstanding the fact that all of these theologians technically ascribe to the belief that the Holy Spirit is just as much a person as the Son or the Father. And so she's shown us in those early chapters, uh, you recall the, the discussion of Montanism, uh, going from, oh, what, we moved from, like, Montanism through Tertullian all the way to Gregory of Nyssa, right, in the patristic chapter. She was trying to make the argument that there was something eruptive and liberating to women about the Spirit's presence and the church type of Christianity. You remember her topology from troll church, sect, and mystic? The church type had always tried to stamp out that eruption, that bubbling up of the Spirit's power outside controllable institutional structures. So she didn't want to say that we needed to go back to the sect, but she wanted to use the mystic, the kind of position in between hardcore institutional Christianity and Christianity without an institution. So the mystic is somebody within the institution who points outside it, somebody who's listening to where the spirit might be calling the church from within the church, and so calling the church to account or give an account for itself, something like that. Regardless of whether or not we bought her historiography, right? Regardless of whether or not we actually bought hook, line, and sinker into the telling of the patristic heritage that she laid out for us, I hope that she showed us that there is an interesting combination of forces between those who, those forms of Christianity which marginalize women institutionally and those forms of Christianity that might be tempted to sideline the spirit. There's a kind of alignment, I was calling it a conspiracy, of oppression and doctrine in this way. And this means that you can't just white out the gendered pronouns from the liturgy or from your theological text in order to fix patriarchy in this case. In this particular case, you would have to go back to the spirit. You'd have to make sure that the spirit is actually as divine a person functionally as the spirit is in traditional stipulations like in the creed. You'd have to go back and look at the structure of the Trinity, which is what she did, which is what we did last week, right? Where we found a way to say that all three persons are involved at every level of constitution within the Trinity. That's the sort of work that actually has to happen if you were to really undo the way that patriarchy has infected the Christian imaginary. The second way, though, the second thing that you would have to do is you have to actually work on your own imaginations. And this is, I think, the very persuasive argument of the chapter on art. You know, no matter how many times you say God is not a man, God the Father is not an earthly father, something like that, if you're still painting God as two men and a bird, that's not a very persuasive statement to make. The power of those representations, though, is that that's the way that our minds work. Even if we say God is not gendered, the ideas that we have and harbor of God might still be gendered. There has to be some sort of work that is exercised on the imagination to set it free of this idolatrous tendency to image God as a person, as a human, not, not a person, I don't want to say that, as a human being. This can be done in two ways, either by playing with gendered images or non-gendered images uh, in the liturgy. So you've seen mutually bombarding metaphors that kind of cancel each other out. For example, last time when we were talking about the Trinity, I always tried to refer to God the Father using a she or her pronoun, something like that, hoping that the that the pronoun and the name canceled each other out in our imaginations and kind of threw us over the edge into something into the, the something or other beyond words which we're trying to actually denote by saying father. Or she suggested this is what happens in 
prayer and contemplation. That as we say these words about God, as we ascribe these titles to God, these names, that the Spirit teaches us how to properly use them. And how to properly use them is not the way that we normally use them, etc. But the Spirit prays within us, and so we enter into an inter intertrinitarian dialogue of God with God. When we say God Father in that sort of contemplative prayer, the Spirit is calling God Father. And Coakley's suggestion is that this is a fatherhood that is not our ordinary human fatherhood. In fact, it cuts off our ordinary human fatherhood patriarchy at its root. And this is why she says we must call God Father. In any case, regardless of whether or not we buy either of those two strategies, I think that she's made a persuasive case, nonetheless, that there is a work that has to be done on our imaginations that is more complicated than simply whiting out all of the gendered imagery for God in our liturgies or in our theologies. If you just white it out, you may still be harboring a gendered image. And so you may still be falling into the temptation to idolatry. So the third and last one, and then we'll have a discussion, is that um, her theology does argues for two things, an expansion of sources and for the importance of prayer. Regardless of whether or not you have bought her particular reading of artistic materials, I think she's made a persuasive case that the utilization of creative materials in the work of theology, that's an important one. That's crucial, actually. Crucial not simply as a kind of test for doctrine. Not simply, uh, it's not like you just test your, test your doctrine of the Trinity by looking at artistic depictions of the same, but that artistic depictions of doctrines can inform the way that we do theological work. I was reminded, do you guys remember the, um, the, uh, the painting where it's the father and then the son sitting on the father's lap and then the bird, but the bird, and the bird is clearly the, the smallest, the father's the biggest. So there's the kind of traditional reading of hierarchy, right? The father being the big one. Um, but then around the bird, around the spirit, is this black circle. And so your eye is immediately drawn to the spirit rather than to the other two persons, even if the other two persons are bigger than the spirit. This was, I was suggesting when we read that chapter, I didn't get to talk about it as much as I would have liked last time. This, I think, even if she doesn't state it forthrightly, is a kind of inspiration for the account that she gave us last time, where she was saying that the contemplative ecstatic will never abide the spirit's marginalization because the spirit has been so important to the contemplative, right? Our eye is immediately drawn to the bird in the dark circle. In any case, I, um, I think that use of creative materials and in the other volumes of the systematic theology that she's yet to write, there will be a turn to poetry, um, to music, and then to the liturgy as a kind of um, combination of all these different forms of art in one. Um, I think she's shown us that this can be incredibly useful for theology. Um, and unfortunately, it is not that common, at least not now. And then the importance of prayer. So again, regard, and I've said this basically at every single point, regardless of whether or not you buy her account of contemplative prayer, hook, line, and sinker, I think she has shown us that it can be incredibly invigorating for theological reflection to include and incorporate at the very root the worship, practice, and piety of the theologian herself. That's a really powerful thing to do. It's a powerful thing to take stock of. If theology is talk about God and prayer is being incorporated into God's own talk about God, which is why she suggested one would imagine that one would have something to do with the other. Teasing out exactly what that relationship is is very difficult. She's given us one version of that. But what I want to say is that the question itself is a crucial one to ask. And that the question is an important one, period, is something that Coakley 